All right. So tonight I want to preach a sermon titled In Defense of the Trinity. In Defense of the Trinity. And uh, brought you to Hebrews chapter 1 because Hebrews chapter 1 has a lot of doctrine in it. It has a lot of doctrine about the Trinity in it. And, and so that's what we're going to look at. And first off, I want to lay a little bit of groundwork. We know that the Trinity, we, we use that word three in one because 1 John 5, 7 says uh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So that's why we use that word. And these three do bear record in heaven, and that's what we believe. <clears throat> and Jesus Christ was brought to this earth. And I want to look at this, and the, my first point, and the reason it's in defense of the Trinity is because this doctrine is being attacked today. People are attacking the Trinity. We know this for sure in our church. There's been heretics thrown out for attacking the Trinity. And I just want to look at the points, some of the, the, uh, the crazy points that they bring up, and just defend the Trinity you know, from the Bible on those points. First off... <clears throat> I want to look at verse number 2 and look down. It says, Hebrews 1 verse 2, it says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So it's real clear in that verse that God, uh, he, he, he uh, appointed Jesus Christ heir of all things, and then it says, by whom also he had, he made the world. So he made the worlds by Jesus Christ, the Son. Okay? And so my first point is the eternal sonship of God. You know, this is what the, the, these people will attack that are denying the Trinity. They'll attack the eternal sonship of, of Jesus Christ. They'll say, well, it was just the Word. It was just the Word in the beginning, you know? Well, the Bible's real clear that it was by Jesus Christ, the Son, He appointed heir of all things, by whom He made the worlds. He made them by Jesus Christ. And I want you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll cross-reference this with another place in the Bible. Now I'll read Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. It says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the Lamb, it says, was slain from the foundation of the world. What is the foundation of the world? The foundation is when God created the world. He's the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So Jesus Christ was there in the beginning with God. You know, we all know John chapter 1 <clears throat> says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Obviously, in the Old Testament, the name of Jesus Christ was not revealed but we, we see that the Word was there with God because the Word is a name used for Jesus Christ. And, you know, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I had you turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Look down at verse number 9. Verse number 9. It says, And to make all men see... What is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by who? By Jesus Christ. It says he created all things by Jesus Christ. Just like Hebrews chapter 1 says, by whom also he made the worlds. It goes a little further here in Ephesians chapter 3 that... He created all things by Jesus Christ. Keep going. Verse number 10, it says, To the intent that now and the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose. Now, how long is eternal? We, we teach this out soul winning. How long is eternal? It's what? Everlasting? Lasting forever? According to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Jesus Christ had an eternal purpose. A, a, a purpose that lasted forever from the beginning of time. Uh, because He created all things. God the Father created all things by Jesus Christ. You see? Um, so, 
Let's, uh, let's turn to another place in the Bible. Colossians chapter 1. And so these people will say that Jesus Christ wasn't the meaning. He was, it was just the Word. God's literal Word was spoken. Well, according to these two verses I just showed you, that's false. You know, it's pretty clear that Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God, and He was God. You know, it, it, it's not, you know, a mystery. Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read uh, John 17, 5. It says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. This is Jesus Christ speaking to the Father. John 17, Jesus praying unto the Father. It says, Glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So he had glory with God the Father before the world was. So that's pretty clear. I don't see how you can be mixed up on this. It's, uh, it's, it's not very hard, but we're going to look at all these arguments because we're going we're gonna to come to a conclusion <clears throat> at the end of all this. I had you turn to Colossians chapter 1 and uh, look down at verse 14. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And then it goes on, verse 16, this is what I want you to pay attention to. It says, for by him were all things created. This is talking about Jesus Christ. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. So these things, again, we're seeing a very, uh, <clears throat> you know, the same thing being said over and over, that Jesus Christ created all things, all things were created by Him and for Him. So that's pretty clear, you know, that, that that's what the Bible teaches. You know, Jesus Christ was there in the beginning. He is God. He was God. There's three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So, the next thing I want to look at, and stay right here in first, first, or Colossians chapter 1, and just look back up at verse 15. It says, uh, speaking of Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. So this brings me to my second point. You know, and my second point is the image of God. Now, everybody, these guys, the, the, these guys who were thrown out of church, they like to say, look, you know, God is invisible, you know, and all these things, and that, you know, you can't see God. Nobody's seen Jesus Christ, which is completely foolish. I mean, that's just, that's just crazy. But I want to I read the definition of invisible. So I just looked up the definition of invisible on dictionary.com. And you know, invisible, number one, it says, not visible, not perceptible by the eye. Now, number two, definition says, withdrawn from or out of sight. So, and then it also says hidden, okay? So, you know, we, we commonly we think of something as invisible as, you know, there's something right here, but I can't see it, you know? But, but the definition chapter 2 just says we've withdrawn from or out of sight. So something that I can't see because it's too far away or because I can't look upon it is invisible. And we see an example of this in the Bible. <clears throat> so turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We're in Hebrews chapter 1. Just turn over to Hebrews chapter 11 real quick. And we'll look at a, a passage about Moses about Moses. And I'll read Exodus chapter 20, or Exodus chapter 20, or 33, verse number 20. And it says, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And we know that Moses, you know, he, he, got, he, he went into the mountain and he's he seen God, uh, you know, and he couldn't look upon him. He had to bow down. <clears throat> but he wanted to see him, and God said, that right here in verse 20, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. But we know what happened in that passage is that you know Moses was hid in the cliff of the rock, and uh, God put his hand over him and passed by, 
And then Moses saw God's back parts. Uh, but he didn't see his face, right? He, he didn't see his face, but he saw his back parts. So, he seen something, though, didn't he? Moses seen something. But he just didn't see God's face. So look down at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 27. Where had you turn? It says, By faith, talking of Moses, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So Moses, you know, endured as seeing him who was invisible. And we know that Moses seen something, right? So he saw him who was invisible. So, but what did Moses not see? He didn't see his face, right? Because it says, no man could see my face and live. You know, so he did see something. So the definition of invisible that the Bible is speaking of is the second definition that I read for you, withdrawn from or out of sight. Out of sight. You know, he's hidden. His face is hidden from us. We can't see the Father's face. Okay? Not Jesus Christ. We cannot see the Father's face. Jesus Christ was made manifest unto us. We, we've seen Jesus Christ. The disciple, have a hand, they handled him. They felt his hands. You know, the, 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 the piercing in his side. Uh, while, while you're sitting there, just turn to Genesis chapter 1. We'll take this a little further. And we'll just see, you know, what the Bible, you know, because, again, this point is the image of God. You know, Jesus Christ, you know, He's the image of the invisible God. So what does that mean? What does it mean that He's the image of the invisible God? Well, Genesis chapter number 1, <clears throat> uh, well, let me read. Let me read Genesis chapter five, verse three. You can flip over if you want. But it says, "And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth." So, so apparently, if I'm looking through this uh, non-trinitarian view, I guess Seth was actually Adam. You know, because he's the image after his image after the image of Adam. You know, he, he begat a son. Is that, is, that, is that what it's saying? No, no, no. No, Seth is Adam's son, and he, he's in his likeness. He looks like Adam because he's his son. He's in his likeness. And not only that, he doesn't have some, some, some uh, he doesn't begat something that's not even human, you know? He doesn't begat a dog, you know? He's also in his likeness because He's a man, right? And we know that God the Father is a man. He's a person. And Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Genesis chapter 1, as you turn there, and verse number 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So man is made in the image of God. Take it a little further, down in verse 27, the next verse says, So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He Him. So we as men are created in the image of God. You know why? Because God looks like a man. He's not some alien or some something that looks crazy, but He's in the image of a, of a man. We're, we're in the image of God. And I'm sorry, you know, it's, you know, some people try to say, well, God's a woman. Well, read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, it talks about how that the man is the image of God, you know, the glory of God, and the woman is the glory of man. Okay, so no, God is not a woman. He is a man. But, uh, you know, but, you know, therefore, using that logic again of somebody that denies the Trinity and believes in this <clears throat> weird other doctrine, whatever you want to call it, oneness, modalism, is, you know, since we're creating the image of God, I guess we're God, huh? Is that what that's saying? Because that's what they're saying about Jesus Christ, is that, that He's the image of the invisible God, therefore He is the Father. You know? It's like, well, no. He's just an image of God. You know, I can hold a picture up 
uh, of myself, but is that me or is that just a picture of me? You know? And, and he's, he's created in the image of God. That means he's just, he, in his likeness, he looks like a man. Jesus Christ was created, or was born into this world. He was not created. He was born in this world by the Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Ghost, and he was a man. You know? And so that's very, very easy to understand. You know, the Trinity is very easy to understand. I don't see how it's hard to understand. I, I was saved at, at 10 years old, and I've always understood the Trinity. It's, it's not that hard to comprehend. But if you're the natural man looking at the Bible, you might come up with something different. You know, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. So, we were in Genesis chapter 1, and you know, that's really all I have for the image of God. That's, it's, it's really not that hard to understand. It's basic. Basic. Now, this, is, this point right here, my next point, is going to be the majority of this sermon. Because this right here is just undeniable. It, it's, it's one of the biggest attacks that these uh, oneness, modalist people have. And all these attacks are on Jesus Christ. You know, you'll notice that. You know, first off, you know, we had, we had uh, the eternal sonship. That's an attack on Jesus Christ. You know, and then we have an attack on the image of God. You know, who God is. Yeah, that's an attack on Jesus Christ. Now, this one is also an attack on Jesus Christ. And uh, so, <clears throat> looking back at our text, text passage, looking back at our text passage, Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, it says in verse number 3, <clears throat> who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Again, I forgot to read that, but that's also right here. Like I said, Hebrews 1 has a lot of doctrine in it. Who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and beholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So, you know, I, pre I preach this all the time when I'm out soul winning, you know, and that is that when Jesus rose from the dead, he was seen of the disciples, of the apostles, and of many people, and on 40 days after, he ascended up into heaven, and he, was, he sat down on the right hand of the Father. I mean, I preach that almost every time I give the gospel. I hardly ever leave that out. Did I say it today? I said it today. I, I mean, I always say it. I've always had that in my gospel. I just say that. You know, why? Because that's what the Bible teaches. You know, Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the Father. And you know, these uh, Trinity deniers, they will, uh, they will mock this. They mock it. And they say that, uh, well, there's only one throne. It's not a two-seater throne. You know, and then they all laugh. They'll laugh and say, it's not a two-seater throne, there's only one throne, there's only one person sitting on that throne. It's like, no. Uh, the Bible is very clear. Very clear. When I say very clear, I mean, I don't know how much more I can say it. Because there is over, uh, there's 20 plus verses that proclaim Jesus Christ being at the right hand of God. All you have to do is just type in right hand in a concordance online or whatever, and you can look up all these verses. I'm not going to have time to go through all these verses, but we're going to look at some of them. You know, and you know, Tyler Baker, the fire, fire deacon and false prophet of today, you know, every time uh, a quote he says, it is, he says, every time you see a throne in the Bible, there's one person sitting on it. You know, and he shows you a whole bunch of Old Testament stuff. Right? It's like, well, uh, Jesus Christ wasn't uh, made manifest in, in, to Old Testament saints, in, in, except for the, a few appearances, you know, in the Old Testament. You know, you can you can find some Old Testament appearances of Jesus Christ where he appears to men on the earth. I mean, he spake with uh, Abraham, you know, all these different places. But he was in the burning, uh, the burning, uh, not the burning bush, the uh, with the, with the uh, three Hebrew boys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, but let's look at Hebrews chapter number 8. Turn there. Turn to Hebrews chapter 8. And uh, I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 3. Here's one of those verses. It says, 
who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. So right here again, very clear, is on the right hand of God. God? God the Father, obviously. Because it's speaking of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter number 8, <clears throat> verse number 1, it says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. I mean, that right there is, I mean, plain as the nose on your face. You know, he sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty. So apparently there is, you know, two people on this throne. You know, there's God the Father and God the Son seated at the right hand. You know, you can mock it all you want. This is what the Bible teaches. You know, I, I mean, I base what I believe off of the Bible. You know, I'm not going to not gonna not turn to all these passages. I'm not going to preach a whole sermon about the throne of God and not turn to any of the passages that deal with Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of God. I mean, how can you preach a whole sermon about that and not turn to one of the 20 plus verses about Jesus Christ being sat at the right hand of God. You know, I called one of those guys right after it happened. And that was the only question I had for him. It's like, so you don't think there's uh, Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father? And he's like, uh, no, that's up for debate. Okay, talk to you later. Click. Like, I'm not even, uh, that's not up for debate when there's 20 plus verses in the Bible that uh, say that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the majesty of God. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says something similar. If you want to flip over just a page or two in your Bible. Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse number 2. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he sat, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Again, very clear. Very clear. Now, we're going to look at some other mentions of it as well, just because this is such a huge thing. And it's so easy to see and prove from the Bible. And it's beyond me how anybody can say that Jesus Christ is not seated at the right hand of God. It just doesn't make any sense. Turn to Mark 14. Mark 14. I'm going to read uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 20. It says, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So God the Father set him at his own right hand in heavenly place in the heavenly places. Now Mark chapter 14 is very interesting. <laughs> Because you, we see an account here of the Jews, you know, mocking Jesus Christ here right before they sentenced him to be crucified. Mark chapter 14, verse number 62, towards the end of the chapter. It says, And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we any further witness? Ye have heard the blasphemy. You know, I mean, that's... Right there, these, these uh, Jews are, are just right here. They're just going ahead. Jesus Christ says, You shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You know, and they rent their clothes and then they, they want him crucified. He says to be crucified. So they're mocking this. They don't believe he's God. And specifically because he's claiming that he's going to sit on the right hand of power. You know? <clears throat> Crazy. Crazy. So many of, many of the verses uh, that contain, you know, being sat at the right hand of God <clears throat> are, uh, are referring back to Psalm 110, verse 1. And it, they all include, you know, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Psalm 110, verse 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, 
Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And Jesus Christ refers back to this, you know, a lot in the New Testament. <clears throat> All, most of the Gospels refer back to this. <clears throat> Mark chapter 22, verse 44, it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And Jesus Christ goes on to explain, you know, that David wasn't speaking of himself. He was talking of Jesus Christ. You know, <clears throat> and then it even goes on. It says they durst not ask him any question after that. You know, they feared. <laughs> they didn't, it was like, mind blown. <sighs> you know, but anyways, Mark, uh, that was Matthew chapter 22, verse 44. But Mark chapter 12, verse 36 says, For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And we see this over and over again. Acts chapter 2, verse 34, you know, right after we see where Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. <clears throat> then in verse 34 it says, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he, ha he, he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy, thy, in, thy foes thy footstool. And then in Hebrews, Hebrews, again, a book of, a lot, lot of doctrine in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. It says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for the sins, for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth except, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. So we see a really big theme of until his enemies be made his footstool. And so uh, since I have the time, I just want to look at this real quick. <clears throat> look at one thing about you know the timing of that. When his enemies are made his footstool. Just because it's interesting and it again it it uh, it you know, confirms the Trinity very clear in uh, the book of Revelation. But 1 Corinthians 15, turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23 real quick. And I just want to look at what the Bible says, when this will take place. You know, until his enemies be made his footstool. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. It says... But every man in his own order, <clears throat> Christ the firstfruits, after they that are Christ at his coming, then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put, all, put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, uh, accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all." So, verse 26 makes it real clear. The last enemy that's going to be destroyed is death. So, that's the last enemy that's going to be destroyed. That uh, <clears throat> when all things are going to be put under his feet, death shall be destroyed. Now, we know in the book of Revelation that this happens in chapter number 20. Chapter number 20. So, if you want to turn there, you can look at this. It's really interesting because chapter number 20 ends talking about the second death. Right? In verse 14, a lot of people use this while giving the gospel. <clears throat> but uh, Revelation 20, verse 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 15. Or chapter 20. Verse number 14. The last two verses. I gotta turn there. Revelation chapter 20. Uh, okay. 
okay, yeah, I was right. I'm just overlooking this. In verse 14, it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So death is cast into the lake of fire. You know, this is the second death. And so death is destroyed at that point. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14. And uh, cast into the lake of fire. And then right when we get into chapter 21, chapter 21 goes right into uh, the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Okay? And that chapter, you know, that's basically what it's all about is the new Jerusalem. It, uh, it, in verse 1, of chapter 21 it says and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I John saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband <clears throat> and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. So chapter 20, right, is about <clears throat> the millennial kingdom. And it ends with death and hell being cast into the lake of fire. And so Jesus Christ was reigning on this earth in the millennial is reigning on the earth in the millennial kingdom. And then chapter 21, we see the tabernacle descending out of heaven. And verse number 3 says. <laughs> God Himself shall be with them. So who, what, what part of the Godhead, what part of the Trinity is dwelling with them coming down uh, from the tabernacle? God the Father. Jesus Christ is already on the earth. He, he's been ruling and reigning for a thousand years. So God the Father is coming down to the earth and it says, and He will dwell with them. They shall be His people and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. You know, so Jesus Christ is already ruling. So this is definitely the Father coming down to dwell on the earth. And death and hell have been destroyed, right? Until his enemies be made his footstool. So, two people here. Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning on the earth. Now God the Father is descending from heaven, the new Jerusalem. And <clears throat> it goes on and explains the new Jerusalem. It explains it really in depth. And then Revelation chapter 22 goes a little further. And uh, verse number 3, it says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their forehead. So, at this point, God comes down, and it uses an interesting phrase. It uses an interesting phrase. It uses it twi twice. In verse 3, it says, But the throne of God and of the Lamb. I'm going to back up. The throne of God and of the Lamb. So it's saying that the throne of the Father and of the Lamb, we see that God the Father came down. Jesus Christ was already ruling and reigning. God's going to dwell with men. Now it's calling it the throne of God and of the Lamb. And it goes on, I think it's in verse number 5 of chapter 22. Uh... <clears throat> No, it's actually, it's actually in verse number 1. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water, uh, of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So it says it again. It says it twice. The throne of God and of the Lamb. And then, notice verse 4. It says, And they shall see his face. Now, we've seen Jesus Christ, or men have seen Jesus Christ's face. Okay, at this point, Jesus Christ has been ruling and reigning for a thousand years. So men have seen his face. Okay? So whose face is it talking about that we're going to see? We're going to see God the Father's face at this point, and his name shall be in their forehead. So, you know, God is invisible because he's, you know, he's we can't see his face at this time. Moses couldn't look upon his face. Nobody's seen the Father. Nobody can see the Father and live. But guess what? One day we will see the Father's face. You know? And also the Son. For a thousand years he's going to reign. You know? And, you know, it's, it's really clear. And I said we were going to bring this to a conclusion. Bring this to a conclusion. So I want to just turn to uh, Romans chapter 1. Okay? Romans chapter 1. Because a lot of people will, 
will uh, say, well, are these people not saved? You know, what's going on? You know, it's clear that they're worshiping a different God, you know. And it's, it's pretty crazy. But <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, it says in verse 17, Romans chapter 1, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So these people, they're holding the truth in unrighteousness. So they're not saved. They're, they're unrighteous. And, but they know the truth. Right? And it goes on verse 9. It says, Because that which may be known to God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. So God showed them the right way. They're holding the truth in unrighteousness. And it goes on in verse 20. It says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They're clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. And even His eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. Even His eternal power and Godhead. I mean, it's very clear that it's, it's clearly seen. I mean, I just showed you clearly that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. He was eternally with God. You know, He's not some created being that came into existence at His birth. You know, He is a man and... You know, God said, let us make man in our image, speaking to himself and his son, you know, and the Holy Spirit being there. And the Holy Spirit does have a body, by the way. We see it at the baptism of Jesus Christ. He descended in bodily shape. I mean, that's right. That's right. Even my son knows it. So, the thing is, if we keep reading in Romans chapter 1 and verse 19... Or not verse 19, verse 21, where we stop. So that they are without excuse, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know, and that's really clear that these people are professing themselves to be wise, you know, because, I mean, I'm not a pastor, and but I can see these things, I can prove these things from the Bible, but when you're just, when you're just getting online and, and, and you're just making videos about the Bible, that, and then you're just saying, you know, this is right because I say so, you know, they're professing themselves to be wise, you know, and the Bible says they became fools. <clears throat> they changed the glory of God, <clears throat> the glory of the uncorruptible God, into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. So they made the uh, <clears throat> God into an image, right? They're, they're so caught up on this image. Image of God. Image of God. You know... An image made like to corruptible man. You know what? My the God that I believe in, the God that you know the Bible proclaims, I can't really explain the Trinity real well. You know, everybody has these examples of the Trinity. They say, well, the best example is the egg, or the best example is this. Well, you know, the best example is just what the Bible says. You know, my God isn't made unto a corruptible man. You know. I can't, I can't explain the Trinity real well except for these three are one. There are three people that are one God. You know, I can't, you can't explain, explain it in man's terms because then it would be made like unto a corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You know, and then it goes on, the famous passage, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You know, they've changed the truth of God into a lie. I mean, that's what it is. They, they, they're mocking how people give the gospel now. It's crazy. It's beyond me. But, Romans chapter 1, 
famous passage about what? Reprobates. You know? You may not like it, but it's real clear. Clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in God. His eternal power, maybe, you know, his eternal sonship, how Jesus Christ was the son in the beginning. God created all things by him. So to conclude the sermon, number one, Jesus, Jesus has always been the son of God. You know? And number two, he is the physical likeness of his father. You know? He's created in the image of God. He's not some non-human. You know? He's a man. And God also is a man. God the Father. Number three, we've seen that, you know, right now, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of God the Father. Very clear. No doubt... These things are all proved easily with the Bible. And so, this is in defense of the Trinity. You know, the Trinity is a biblical doctrine, and, you know, it's without excuse. It's something, you know, we preach without even knowing it when we go out and give the gospel. You know, we preach that God the Father sent His Son, and that when people receive the Son, when they call upon His name, they receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. You know, that's the Trinity right there. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, just thank You for this day. Thank You for Your Word being so clear about this subject and how, you know, the Trinity is undeniable. It's in the Bible. And anyone who wants to mock at it, or say that it's not in the Bible, it's just being foolish. Their foolish heart has been darkened, Lord. And I just pray that you will, uh, you know, maybe somebody is teetering on the fence and they just don't understand this doctrine, Lord. But I just pray that they'll dig into these verses that I showed. Look up how you're seated at the right hand of your Father, Lord, and just, uh, you know, believe what the Bible says. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.